a black female student say to me that when she tried to bring in the conversation of misogyny and patriarchy, she was told, well, how do you know that patriarchy existed before colonialism, right? And that question wasn't asked to be answered. It was asked to shut down the conversation to say that this is not something that requires our attention right now. Um, and I think, I think, again, if we look to Fanon and Lewis Gordon, uh, another complication or, or contradiction arises for us. Right? Um, because Gordon, when speaking on Fanon, discusses the ways in which blacks have always been collapsed into the collective. Right? So you can make general propositions about black people. There's no requirement to consider the individual aspect because a black is not an individual human. Right? So what does it mean then when we want to articulate an affirming or productive politics on the same basis? Right? That your blackness is all you can be and must be. Right? And that to want to speak as an individual outside of blackness is an impossibility, right? Is a contradiction or is a black invoking whiteness, right? To be an individual is to be white. So what does it mean when those who we consider to be our radical leaders of now perpetuate the same type of thinking? That you can't exist outside of the collective, right? That there's no such thing as an individual black desire. That the question is, as Fanon asks, what do blacks want, right? However, Fanon acknowledged the fact that what an individual black desires might not be what the collective desires, which doesn't take away from the collective project, but complicates the ways in which, in that collective project, we then try to shut down alternative narratives. Um, so just to to go back to the question, and now I'm going to try to flip through my book here, uh, of the relationship between decolonizing the university and decolonizing the world. Um, and and, and Hooks uses the Stuart Hall quote, which I think for me clarified the ways in which, even though the university is an elite space, right? even though the university is a minority space, not everyone will ever come to university. There are strong linkages between the university and society which make the project of decolonizing the university extremely important. And the quote is, the ways in which black people, black experiences were positioned and subjected in the dominant regimes of representation were the effects of a critical exercise of cultural power and normalization. Not only in Saeed's oriental sense, were we constructed as different and other within the categories of knowledge of the West by those regimes. They had the power to make us see and experience ourselves as other. It is one thing to position a subject or set of peoples as the other of a dominant discourse. It is quite another thing to subject them to that knowledge, not only as a matter of imposed world domination, but the power of inner compulsion and subjective confirmation to the norm. And, and that also brings in the question of the articulation of blackness as social death, right? As blackness is having to exist as alienation, exclusion, and non-recognition. Because if that's the discourse in which we articulate the politics of now, right, what will be the productive politics that we then want to emerge? Right? If to be black in this world can only be to be non-existent, right, what is the aspiration of resistance? What is the goal in trying to contest power in different spaces? Which is not to disqualify those positions, right? But I think which is to call us to think a lot more critically and deeply than we have been about the tools in which we speak back to power, which are then going to affect the ways in which we invoke power as and when we create those spaces that Nelson spoke about, in which we have some source of autonomous independence. Um, and so I think. What's also important is the relationship that Professor Torres spoke to about the liberal capitalist state and the way in which the university is run. Because if the core is for free education, right, but free education that should be paid for by government, right? Not that education should be free, or some say that should be paid for by an increased corporate tax, etc. Um, in what ways does that challenge the fact that the university is still a commodity, right? 
in what ways does that challenge the fact that we have in South Africa universities that don't respond to the social context, right? Um, and for some people, they make the argument that in the case of government, if education is free and government picks up that book, at least then they'll start to see the university as a public good, right? And for that public good to produce anything that's worthwhile, it must be socially responsible, right? And in that way, then you start to change the culture and nature of the university into one that responds to the social crisis which we have in our country. Um, but which came in on our conversation on Friday as well, the, I'll just emphasize it again that the core to free education, right, is just the beginning, right? But free education in a colonial university has the danger of, like we've heard, just reproducing, right, those who can perform whiteness to an extent that when we become the professors of the future, we then gatekeep the true radical change, right? Um, we know that to get through the system, and it's something difficult to have to accept as a postgraduate student, you have to master techniques of assimilation, right? Uh, master the techniques of oppression and exploitation. And so to be a success, you have to be a failure to the emancipatory project, right? And so how do we deal with that contradiction? How, how do we be both the, the, ma the master of the master's techniques, right? and still try to be that rebel slave that then dethrones the master. And, and that's a complicated question to answer, right? Um, and a difficult one as well. Uh, I think the question of, of black academics, uh, Professor Torres, is, is also asked in a way to escape responsibility, right? Um, we ask, what are black academics doing, right? Academics who've just been given access to the space. But rather, the question should be, why are ac white academics still doing, right? Still doing the nothing that has perpetuated this problem to begin with. Um, and in the context in which we know they will not change, right? I don't think it's a question of, do we know how anymore, have we had enough time, etc. We know that the will is not there, right? then why is it that we have a position in which government executives and councils, etc., do not create the space for them to massive, <coughs> on mass vacate, right? How do we make the university a space where if you won't transform, you have to leave? Mm -hmm. And rather the people who put in that vulnerable position of perhaps having to leave is those progressive academics who do want change, mm -hmm. right? And, and that goes to I think the, the nature of how a university is set up. Uh, I just want to make another point about the issue of acknowledging students and including them. Okay? And I mean, I think the including into what is extremely important. Because what have we seen in engagements with management is that, okay, students, you can come sit in Senate, right? A Senate which is and can only be an oppressive and anti poor, anti black space, right? So what, what then does access mean? I, I think the, the anger that came against the, the SRC slogan of access must rise is that you give access to institutions that can very effectively shut people down, mm -hmm. right? And so fine students, choose a leader who can come now sit at the table with the executive council and discuss on your behalf, right? And someone earlier tried to speak about uh, co-option and, and patronage uh, but the way in which it's positioned is in, in one in which it's easy for students to buy into that, right? Well, the call is we say me that you want free education, right? Here the NRF is going to pay your fees for the next five years. Obviously, we can't pay for all the comrades, but that's what you want, right? Mm -hmm. How does he say no in that situation, mm -hmm. right? And we've seen scholarships emerging from places we didn't know for student leaders mm -hmm. to say, here, pay for your fees. Mm -hmm. You know, we want you to stay. And once that co-option has happened, what then is the relationship between that student and the collective? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I, I think Professor Torres' um, example of autonomous spaces that are created both outside but within is extremely important, right? Because the, the University Senate Council is never going to be a democratic space. Um, Professor Malekani from Economics gave a talk the other day uh, in terms of the question that was asked about principles and values. And he said that 
you know, Vitz policy is some of the most progressive ever, right? And he says, but what Vitz management does on a daily basis has no relationship to the policy. So what do we say then as students when we're ignorant of the policy? We say, oh, the university is this, it's that. And then when Adam goes on TV, he just pulls out the policy, right? But the everyday running of the university is not in line with that policy. And so I think there are different levels. Professor Malikane speaks of how there are academics who are trying to challenge those very policies, right? The fact that the dean sits in this council in the school and this incestuous relationship that maintains a particular power balance, right? A power that, uh, it was very amusing to me to hear that the pre President Zuma's speech um, yesterday, I've never heard an ANC speech that said white supremacy and anti-blackness so many times, right? Uh, another co-option of discourse to try and pretend that, you know, it's not a problem. Um, but but a, a, a speech about white supremacy and then a hashtag saying, you know, racism must fall, etc. <laughs> it, it's ironic, right, in ways in which he wouldn't see. Um, and so I think just in closing, what's important for me is that we keep being advised as students that to be taken seriously, we have to maintain discipline, keep a moral high ground, etc. Right? And those people who give this advice in good faith uh, have no interrogation of, well, what is morality? Who's morality? And who does it aim to assist? Right? And what is discipline? This discipline that must be maintained. And, and to, to allow us to continue being engaged with the university, when has the university ever engaged in a way that has truly delegitimized itself? Right? Um, and so, so for me, in closing, I think it's more important for us to highlight our complexities, our contradictions, our inconsistencies, and our limitations. If we're going to end up in a position that doesn't just regurgitate the same type of repressive power which we've seen over the last thousands of years. Thanks. <laughs>
educated at vets were weak. <laughs> <laughs> also that, the preparation from undergraduate itself had produced weak students. My point was, you breed weak students, you cannot make the students the problem. You cannot make that our problem. The reality is that at that stage, they were still asking us to read the same people we were reading from first year. Even as, as they said, they are reorganizing. The USA professor then pressed charges against me at the university legal office and asked the dean of students to take me through a disciplinary process for misconstruing her meaning and dividing her with her colleagues. <laughs> it never happened, but I did register from sociology department in fear they would punish me in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> Decolonizing the university cannot be an abstract discussion for me. I want to bring it home right here with us. In a different way, I wish to return to the argument I made when registered as an MA, and perhaps at the same time make a broader claim on culture and struggles in decolonizing the university. There is a way in which the Bantu in the university is still being Bantu educated. Advanced Bantu education is basically creating out of Bantu's intellectuals who will not, as Fanon puts it, dissect the heart of their people. Fanon says the native intellectual who take up arms to defend his nation's legitimacy and who wants to bring proofs uh, to bear out that legitimacy, who is willing to strip himself naked to study the history of his body is obliged to dissect the heart of his people. Advanced Bantu education teaches us, socializes us to deny our bodies. It teaches us to reject them as, a, as problematic bodies and to refuse interrogating their histories. Here at VET, through radical Eurocentric theory of Marxism, reformisms of Ebenezerism, Dekheim, you know the rest. The Bandu is taught to ignore the history of his body, and her body, and their body. In Bandu education, we are taught to mimic, and the entire process of knowledge production are full of mimicry and repetition. Mimic the master, the idea of class, here always functions to silence the experience of blackness. Not because the intellectual does not know how to think through the ways in which capitalist modernity articulated in the colonial situation, but because of a commitment to what they call the non-racial ideology. Repetition in, what we re in that we repeat each other, we repeat the things that have been said before, like a form of recitation, recitation in primary school. <laughs> all you need is to memorize, memorize, and we ask all questions, but not the ones that have to do with the history of our bodies. We also read no one black. All Bantus, we only read Bantus who repeat the master. And they are the ones that are validated. At different stages, the academy, Often because of the pressure of students, then introduces Fanon and Biko uh, readings, or a seminar on race, or a conference on decolonization. <laughs> <laughs> this is the closest they get to decolonization today. There are no experts in the core phenomena of decolonization in the university, and thus, if you choose this route, they always supervise you back into repetition of their ideas or in ways that do not break or disrupt the core of liberal non-racial ideology. Bantu intellectuals are therefore graduates of repetition and mimic. There is hardly any sign of their work in their work that they are the colonized or the natives. Even my MA is a, is a, is a band, advanced Bantu studies. <laughs> Therefore, when studies rise, when students rise and fees must fall and begin to speak for themselves, you can hear that they have been reading outside the curriculum because they place value where the academy does not. What follows is a conference, a dialogue, a reinscription of non-racialism, non-violence, and reconciliation. <laughs> Fanon argued that decolonization is inevitably a violent process. That violent substitution of one species for another, where the native's dream is to take the place of the master. It is an important step, I tell you, for a native to drive the master out of control and take control of the system. We must never undermine that. We must never devaluate 
it's decolonization. Sometimes it's a, it's a system, violent system of substitution. The basis of violence is precisely the silencing the native of the native because colonialism is a way of living where natives are silenced permanently, where they silence each other, where they learn not to speak out, speak for themselves. This violence is carried out from generation to generation. The reason natives are silenced is not because the oppressor is scared of the things they have to say. The oppressors are never scared of the things you have to say. The oppressor does not see the native as capable of speaking coherently, of civilization. The native is an animal, you know that, a permanent child who is in permanent need of supervision. <laughs> this makes the native want to prove to the white world that they are capable of civilization. Yes. Their intellectual energy is then invested in traveling to history to prove this and that civilization, this and that black civilization. But soon, a native discovers no colonial system, this is a fan on quote, draws its justification from the fact that the territories it dominates are culturally non-existent. You will never make colonialism blush for shame by spreading out little known cultural treasures under its eyes. <laughs> you can travel as far back as the Memes who, who united lower and upper Egypt uh, and, you know, invented mathematics and all those things. That won't make colonialism blush of shame. They're not scared of those things. The path to the past is not to return to it. That is why it is a past. The path to the past must be to open up a future for on saints and inspire hope. Let new traditions flourish. Do not prison us in customs. In any way, Fanon says customs are degenerate culture. It's, it's when culture is degenerated. So, uh, which of course accounts for that whole type of black scholarship, which is about, you know, thinking and proving that, oh, we, we were also civilized in the past. And it finds a lot of expression in the academy. Our world is much more complex than the world Fanon studied. Uh, as you know, I don't have time. In black, in, in South Africa, blacks preside over the largest white population of any white politically ruled by blacks in the world. The thesis, the basis of this remains a colonial relationship. There's no way it can continue to remain uninterrupted because it is false and deeply disingenuous. Member once wrote, which broke my heart in the Mail and Guardian, broke a lot of our hearts in the EFF. South Africa is the only place in the world where revolution happened, and yet the former oppressors lost nothing. But how did this misfortune happen? And how, did, how is it that it continues to happen? How could two times exist in one? How can we live in both post-apartheid and apartheid South Africa at the same time? How, how did such madness, how does it exist? This is testimony to the idea that time is linear and always married to space is false. The idea also that history is a forward march. Life can go back, multiple times can exist, as does multiple subjectivities. People can have more than one relationship to themselves. It is not, an, it's not there's no one essential relationship that we have in ourselves in ways that we are in the world. It attests to that this very moment that we are in attests that the theoretical epistemological basis that are, are being sang here and choruses of repetition in the university. You know, uh, they are, our time already speaks back to them as, a, as empty of understanding our reality. So, and here you find the pitfalls of Congress nationalism. It's the heritage of Marxist compliant nationalism. The NDR, the Harold Wolby type of race theory. Congress nationalism is substitution without violence. It's a substitution without violence. <coughs> Transitions that made all our struggle about civil rights, reconciling with white people, I mean, what an objective. <laughs> the struggle no longer became about means of subsistence, which our people called the land. It became about 
reconciling with Carl and, and, and reconciliation and I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Congress nationalism suffered the same pitfalls, therefore, of mimicry and repetition. The situation of mimicry repetition, non-racialism, reconciliation, and the primacy of the class theory is creating its own destruction every day. It is such a violent thing. It is such, it is the normal, it's normalized everyday violence. The crushing of the black people from speaking. So the hope, the hope, if, if and this is, uh, I think it's chapter three, or chapter four, on national culture and the record of the earth. There's no, decolonizing the university here in a conversation or, or, or asking the questions, professor, like investing in the questions of the students. Once you invest in the questions of the students, you have already worn them into mimicry. So they're going to ask your questions. Everybody, all the theses of uh, SWA as an institute of uh, history, what, what, all the projects that have ever existed. At the core, there are repetitions. At the core, there are repetitions and multiple silences in which we come to silence ourselves. And we come to accept that there's a normal way of doing knowledge, of knowing the world, and therefore we go elsewhere to be, to be violent. That intellectual, it, it, the hope is in the struggle. There is no other way of decolonization that does not join the picket lines of the everyday people's struggles. I don't mean fees must fall. People's daily struggles. Fees must fall still exist at the horizon that is actually distances from the people. And, and hence its own contradictions. It's still all the Sasko comrades who used to cause trouble in the universities. Go ask them. When they go back home, they can identify with demands of water and all those things. Their whole language. Here, the intellectual must lose themselves to the people, to their language, to their culture, to their hopes. In fact, Fanon characterizes that movement. As a, as a serious uh, trauma to the intellectual native. It's very traumatic. You must ask me. <laughs> you, you go there, uh, there to that thing we call the township. You can't talk like this. It's not.